Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you guys are all having a great day. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with our presentation this morning. I want to thank you all for being here, and I'm going to turn it over to Elle. Hi, everyone. I'm Elle. I'm Paragus's marketing coordinator. And today we're going to be talking about protecting protecting your data from common attacks and threats. Um, so Delcy Bean, Paragus's CEO, will talk about the most common threats to data loss. And we also have a guest speaker from Datto, Desiree Thomas, who will be talking about the best solutions to help protect your data. Um, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to throw them in the chat. We will save time at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. Um, and this webinar is a special one because we will be we will be giving away two Yeti hard coolers to two lucky attendees. And the winners will be announced after the webinar. So let's get started. All right, well, thank you very much, Ellen. Again, thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, before we jump into the actual content, just for those people who are not as familiar with Paragus, just a kind of a quick overview of who Paragus is. We are an employee-owned company located in Hadley, Massachusetts, now with an office in central Massachusetts. We're just over 50 full-time employees, and we specialize in helping small and medium-sized businesses in the New England area manage and take care of their technology needs. And that's really one of the key things that we're here to talk about today. What we like to think of as our core purpose is this idea of making IT fun. And what we mean by that is IT shouldn't be frustrating or intimidating. It should be something that enables your business to be more successful, more efficient, more competitive, and ultimately more successful in the market. In order to do that, we need to work really hard to in order to make sure that the technology is easy to use, simple to understand, and that we need help, it's easy to get that help. And that's one of the things that we wanna talk about today is backups and disaster recovery can be a very scary topic that can be quite intimidating to a lot of people. Some organizations are spending too much, some are spending too little, and everybody loses some amount of sleep to the idea of what if. And really what we wanna do is try to give you some tips and tricks today that will hopefully help you sleep a little bit better at night and feel more confident. The Paragus company is broken into four distinct pillars of IT. We have one department dedicated to providing on-demand support, one department focused on providing security and compliance solutions, a strategic planning division, and a newest division that we've been talking a lot about this year is our business automation division, which helps organizations leverage technology to be more efficient in the way that they operate. And then underlining these four pillars of IT is our projects department. Without further ado, though, let's jump into the topic today of why are we here? What is the goal of today's conversation? I don't think I have to convince anybody on this call how critical IT has become to running our businesses. From our phones, to our email, to the software that we use to run our companies, to the way that we communicate with all of our customers, employees, and vendors. We rely on technology for so much of what we do. At the same time though, that means that it's that much more important that we protect that technology. Downtime and outages are so much more impactful now than they were five years ago and certainly 10 years ago. And so what are the threats that we're trying to protect our organization from? From a data standpoint, we've got the first being human error. Human error happens all the time. It's probably happened twice in your business today. Somebody accidentally opened up an Excel spreadsheet and instead of hitting save as, hit save and overrode the copy from last month or somebody accidentally deleted a folder thinking it was something else, and now a key piece of data is gone. There's also natural disasters. We've seen in New England, everything from hurricanes to earthquakes to huge snowstorms, all kinds of natural disasters that can impact the data in your organization. Then we've got corruption. Most of you on this call have probably experienced some bad Windows update or Outlook mailbox that got lost or file that got copied too many times or Excel database or Access database that got corrupted. Data corruption is a common occurrence in the world. And as we get more and more complex, corruption becomes more and more common. 
Then unfortunately, we have those rogue employees, the bad apple that wants to cause harm to the business, either by extracting data from the business or destroying data within the business or both. Oftentimes, this is an exiting employee who doesn't feel good about the way the termination happened and is trying to inflict some sort of damage on the organization. And then finally, the one I probably have to explain the least is the world of cyber criminals. And this unfortunately has just become such an increased threat to businesses. Gartner recently said this is the number one threat to small businesses. Cyber criminals causing damage either through wire fraud, ransom, or one of the many other tactics they use to disrupt and extract revenue from our organizations, and in many cases, causing damage that can uh, eventually lead in that business going under. So with all of that dependency being higher, and the threat being higher, it is more important than ever that we're really thinking about how do we manage and protect the data that our business depends on in order to do the work that we do and serve the clients that we serve. So I want to start with changing some expectations around backup. And that's really why we brought you together today for this webinar. Backup isn't new. We've been talking about backup forever. There's nothing revolutionary about the idea of you need to back up your data. However, a lot has changed in the way that our networks are designed, the way we use technology, and the way that we interact with technology. But in too many cases, the backups haven't changed to keep up. And more and more frequently, what we're running into is organizations that have a legacy backup system, but a more modern dependency on data. The confluence of those two things is not good. Oftentimes what we'll find is the backups a client needs are not the backups they have, which can be disastrous if the situation is we're trying to recover from something like a ransomware attack. So think about it. Not that long ago, our networks looked something like this. There were servers and firewalls and computers and everything was in one premise. We had control over it. And we did things like write tape backups and put things on hard drives. Everything was physical. Everything was that we could touch or feel. That's not the way it looks today, though. And there's two major changes. First of all, most organizations have moved a significant percentage of their email uh, to the cloud. These are the two largest providers by far. And five years ago, something like 95% of businesses had their email on-premise. Today, it's almost the exact opposite. In a very short amount of time, relatively speaking, most organizations move their email to the cloud. Now, there's a million reasons that that's a great thing. It adds scalability, improved access, and provides numerous additional benefits. However, it is a major change. And what a lot of organizations did not realize is that when you move to the cloud, you still need to have backups for that email. And that sounds self-explanatory, but in many cases, that's not the reality. So when we had our mail servers on site, we all knew we had to back them up. And we had all kinds of solutions from tape backups to hard drives, a lot of the things I was talking about earlier that we used to back up those email servers and email systems. When we move to the cloud though, a lot of people just assume that part of the service you're getting from Microsoft or Google includes that backup and that you're not only outsourcing your mail, you're also outsourcing the backups of that mail. Well, unfortunately that reality is not true and neither Microsoft nor Google do have external or separate backups of your mail systems, which means that if a hacker gets into your email and corrupts or deletes or encrypts your data, or a bad employee goes in there and deletes a bunch of data intentionally, or there's corruption that causes a mailbox to get damaged or destroyed or lost, or somebody accidentally deletes a bunch of really critical information, all the things that we were talking about earlier that can happen when your mail is on premise can still happen in the cloud. However, in the cloud, if you don't have a backup system, you won't have ability to recover. And that's one of the key things that we wanna to talk to you about today is really first and foremost, just making sure that everybody simply understands that. And then second, to talk to you about how you can fairly easily and cost-effectively mitigate that risk. 
The other reason that this conversation is so important and the other thing that has changed in the last five years is the evolution of cyber threats. When we were first thinking about what backups should look like and designing what we would now call legacy backup solutions, the cyber threat was very different than it is today. The cyber threats of today are much scarier and much more intense. And therefore, we need to have a backup solution that appropriately responds to that. One of the most common things you'll hear about for anybody who has been hit with a ransomware attack is that frequently you'll hear that the hacker not only destroyed their data, but also destroyed their backups. If you don't have the right backups in place, you're not actually protected from these cyber criminals because they know that their first line of defense and not having to pay them the money that they want to get paid is to restore your data from backup. So they have a very large economic incentive to try to destroy those backups. And if your backups haven't evolved over the last five years, if you're still backing up your systems the same way you were before these cyber threats were, are what they are today, then you're inadequately prepared to ward off those cyber threats. So just a couple of stats to throw at you guys to kind of maybe help further illustrate this point. 43% of all cyber attacks are aimed at small and medium-sized businesses. And that's a number that's growing. The hackers are quickly realizing that the small business target tends to be the best target. They're big enough that they have assets worth stealing, but oftentimes don't have the same protections, oversight, and management that a larger company might have. 85% of all email attachments are now harmful. That's a scary, crazy statistic. This one I actually had to fact check. It blew my mind so much. Unfortunately, what's happening is hackers have just really found this to be an effective way to deliver viruses, ransomware, and phishing attacks. And so these enormous, inordinate amount of the email attachments that are going around have some sort of malicious intent behind them. 91% of attacks are launched from a phishing attack. So phishing attacks tend to be one of the most common ways that cyber criminals are going to get into your organization. And then from there, they're gonna use that phishing attack to further uh, infiltrate the network. This one is just astounding. Cybercrime by the end of this year will cost six trillion US dollars. There are very few things that we can say cost the US economy six trillion dollars. And the fact that cybercrime has hit this number as quickly as it has is really what underscores this point. And we're talking about that number, we're just talking about the physical damage, the financial damage caused to the businesses that are being attacked. It's not an insignificant amount of money. And this idea that it won't happen to me or you know, we're too small to be a target or I've heard about that, but we're in an industry that nobody cares about. None of those excuses apply anymore. We have seen everything from small nonprofits to businesses that nobody's ever heard of to large organizations to medium-sized organizations from healthcare to manufacturing. There really, there is nobody who's off limits. If you're using technology to run your organization, you are a target, and at some point in time, you're going to receive an attack. It's no longer a question of if, it truly is a question of when. And that's why this conversation around preparedness is so important, because you don't need to have it be a devastating event. You just need to be well prepared. 24,000 new malicious apps are removed from the App Store daily. I think a lot of people think of the app stores as being a safe place, but this is becoming a new target as well. Apple and Android are seeing this massive influx of apps being published to their app stores that are designed to cause harm to the end user. And these are things that we used to think of as a trustworthy source. Most people don't question if it's on the app store, I can download it. That's no longer the case. And they are catching them and removing them, but not as quickly as they're being added and installed on phones. And then ransomware, I probably don't have to tell you, is up 180% from 2018. We're not talking just about the ones that make the news. For every major event that you see in the news, like the city of Atlanta or the meat manufacturer or the oil and gas pipeline, for each of those major headline stories, there's a few thousand other events that happen 
that either the business owner or the business did not disclose or make public for obvious reasons, or just weren't big enough to make the news. But these are happening all the time, constantly. This is a weekly occurrence. Uh, this is, in fact, something that is happening every 13.275 seconds. That's how common this has become. And that's just astounding compared to where we were five years ago when a lot of the backup systems that are in place today were designed. The things on this screen that you see right now weren't true when you designed your last backup system in many cases. And so that's why it's so important that we kind of take a fresh perspective and a fresh look at how our backups are designed, what they are and are not capable of protecting us from, and what we may need to do to change our approach and strategy. And with that, I am going to hand it off to our guest who's here with us today from Datto, uh, Desiree. I'm gonna go ahead and give you control and let you take over. Fantastic, thank you so much. And thank you everyone for having me. Um, as Delcy said, my name is Desiree Thomas. I'm one of the channel development managers for a company called Datto. Um, and at Datto, we do a lot of different things, but, and I'll go over that in just a quick second here. But first I just, wanted to make sure I, oh there we go I just wanted to talk to why you guys are such a target um I go I tend in my, in my role I do a lot of presentations I do a lot of talking to you guys small to medium sized business owners um and let's face it small to medium sized business owners you guys you are the people who spend 80 hours a week working for yourself so you don't have to spend 40 hours a week working for someone else you put your heart and your soul and everything into these businesses which is a lot and the reason why you guys are targets is because Let's face it, if you put your heart and soul into your business, then if you're willing to pay to get your information back, then people are willing to realize that if you're going to do that, then you're going to pay them to get your information back. Um, and there's several different reasons why you guys are a target, whether it be just a blanket approach. We see things like ransomware as a service. Um, now, the bad guys who are developers who don't even want to necessarily talk to people or deal with people, they just all they do is sit and develop. And then they sell that information or that sell that ransomware to people who they will purchase it and be like, OK, we're just going to send this out to our email list. We'll purchase an email list and we'll send out to an email list and send out to an email list and see who has the lowest hanging fruit. And unfortunately, small to medium sized businesses are such a big range across the entire industry. You hold so much business that that means that blanket approach is going to affect everybody. Um, and unfortunately, at this point in time, a lot of businesses don't necessarily understand the value of IT. You see it, you might have the it might be a finance question when you're trying to talk with your IT service provider and that's the conversation, but it can't be a finance conversation because it's so important now to your business. It's it's as in, or more important than insurance, hands down. Um, so on average, you spend about 10% of your annual uh, budget on IT. Uh, aging equipment and unpatched devices, even some of the biggest attacks that we see in the news are actually unpatched devices where the, the, the patch was actually available. But that's an incredibly time consuming and overwhelming thing to do for even a business that has an internal IT person, that's overwhelming for them. For a business that doesn't have an internal IT person who you might be on your own, that's a huge, huge amount of risk. But unfortunately, patching can be time consuming, overwhelming, and overall don't even know where to start. But the patches have to happen in order to keep yourself secure. Um, like I said, you own business owners, many, many hats. You might be involved in the security of the business, but have no idea what the security of the business is. Usually most of the business owners are the person who runs the till, runs the desk, hires people, trains people, does absolutely everything, which is the amazing part of what you do. But also it means when it comes to security, you don't have the time to focus on it. You don't have the time to focus on your IT. Um, a lot of businesses go back to that. It won't happen to me. We are trained, I think, from the very beginning. I remember if my doctor tells me if I just eat more vegetables, I'll be way healthier and I'm eat more vegetables. That sounds ridiculous. We are trained to believe this is not going to happen to me. I'm not going to hit with ransomware. It's going to happen to somebody else. I don't have to worry about it until it does. And then most, a lot, just realizing that your data isn't valuable. And I go back to right saying, if, you're, uh, if your information, your heart and your soul, everything you put into your business is valuable enough for you to pay the bad guys, then it's valuable enough for the bad guys to try to see if you'll pay. 
And then a lot of people think that it's doesn't, it means you need to be a certain size. Um, I live in Calgary, Alberta, coming to you from good old Canada. And there was um, a, a, a dog rescue place that got attacked. A dog rescue of all places that gets attacked. She's just by herself and she rescues dogs. And she ended up having to close her entire business because she couldn't get any of her information back. That's an example of a blanket of approach. It doesn't matter how si what the size of your business is, um, if, if there's a potential for that to happen to you. So talk more about Datto. If you've never heard of Datto, there's a good chance on this call you've never heard of Datto. It's not because we haven't been around a long time. We work in this really cool middle industry where we help manage server providers like Paragus with the software and the tools that they need to support you guys. So when we're talking about business continuity and backup, that's kind of where we sit in the round. Um, we actually have 24 offices around the world and we support um, small to medium sized businesses and manage service providers worldwide. Uh, one important part to point out is especially when you talk about compliance, if you ever have any compliance issues, we do have data centers when we're working in Canada, you have data centers in Canada, your information stays in Canada, same thing in the US, your information stays in the US, so it won't leave those borders, which is really important a conversation to have when and if you're at any point where you're worried about compliance. So like Delcy said, we want to have this conversation and we need to stop thinking about traditional backup. And in order to stop, in order to have this conversation, you have to understand um, what is not continuity, what's not business continuity. So if your systems were to crash right now, whether it be a fire, a flood, or a hurricane, or whether it be ransomware attack, or whether it be just one of those things that just happens where the internet goes out probably one time a year for four hours, if that was to happen, can you keep up and running? Do you have to shut your business down for that time frame? And when can you be back up and running? So not continuity examples, cloud only. That is not able to be back up and running as quickly as you need it to be. Um, local only, including tape. The number of times you have conversations with small TV or business owners across the board where they're saying, no, it's, it's in a tape, it's in a safe. Well, when was the last time you checked it? Is it even value or is it, is it even work? Um, are you able to boot from it? Has it maybe been corrupted and do you even know? Where is the tape? Who has access to it? And when was the last time it tested? All of those conversations nowadays are incredibly important to have because most businesses can't afford to lose it. If that all that backup on the tape is all, corrupt, all, all corrupted and now you need it, what are your options? And then file-based backup as well. With data, we provide business continuity, Cat, making sure that your systems be back up and running in the event of a disaster or in the event of even those random things like the internet power outages, hurricanes, floods, any of those kind of things. With continuity, you have your cloud, hybrid cloud-based backup. So you need to have the ability to have an on-site as well as cloud-based backup so that way, if a disaster happens, you are up and running in a matter of minutes instead of hours or weeks or months the sad thing about the industry now is a lot of a lot of businesses when they get hit with ransomware unfortunately if they don't have a solution in place they end up going under you need image based backups so just imagine if my computer right now clearly I'm working from home as a lot of people are if my dogs came in or it came in and smashed my computer, I can actually walk into this presentation exactly the way everything is and work from exactly where I was. If you don't have a system where say you just have a file base backup and you're only pulling one file at a time, one file at a time, one file at a time, how long is it gonna get you take a point? If you had to do this presentation and your systems crash, would you be able to keep doing that presentation in the time frame that you need to? I'm going to talk throughout this presentation about RTO and RPO um, and uh, later on in a little bit more detail and give you some actual tools that you can take to know your actual cost of downtime is. But the point of delivering superior RTO, so your RTO is your recovery time objective and RPO is your recovery point objective. So think about how often are you backing up information? Say if we go back to the tape, maybe you're backing up that tape once a day. So if at the end of the day you lose all that information, you've lost all that information for the entire day. And now to get back up and running, if your recovery time objective, if it takes you two weeks to get back up and running, you're going to lose a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of business within that time frame. 
So two points to think about is how often are you backing up your information and how quickly can you be back up and running? With our solution, you can choose how often you back up your information. Most businesses are doing it at least every hour, if not more. They're screenshotting, our system allows you to screenshot to make sure that their, that backup is actually valid, it works, and there's no ransomware in it, which I'll also talk about in a second. But it also means that you can be back up and running as quickly as possible in event of any of those downtimes. Um, all the point of this is making sure that you're eliminating all those, uh, all, all those downtimes. And but that's on it. Most importantly, virtualization, being able to virtualize right in at any point in time so you can be back up and running. But that's not it. There we go, <laughs> a little bit slow of a lag here, but that's not it. Um, we also include ransomware detection. So I go back and talk about that screenshot verification that how often are you backing up your information? Realizing at any point in time, we go back to ransomware is hitting computers every 13 seconds. There's chances, there's already emails in your spam folder that have this in it. So what if one of your staff actually clicks something? The great news with this, with our ransomware detection, every single one of those backups is a screenshot. And then what ends up happening is each one of those screenshots is individually taken and then it's proof point of saying, okay, this is a valid screenshot. This is working. I know this is a legit backup. Everything's going to be good. Next point, wait a second. Now we're going to flag this because it looks like the payload on this backup is completely different than before. Something's changed and we think it might potentially be ransomware. So then Paragus is notified and said, hey, block this. We need to stop this and then roll back to an hour before before you guys even know, and you're up and running in a matter of minutes, and you're protected. That's how quickly and that's how that's how quickly our system works, and that's how important the ransomware detection is. So if we're talking about business continuity, so now we understand the difference between backup and business continuity, and we need to be back up and running as quickly as possible. I'm pretty sure I've droned on that quite a little bit, but we need to talk about, start thinking about continuity and we need to think about continuity for all your devices. Dalcy did a great job of talking about, of starting a conversation about SaaS protection. Those systems that were in every single day, if you lost your G Suite or if you lost your Google Workspace or your Microsoft 365 right this moment, could you continue to do your day? Could you continue to do your job? And what um, Dalcy said right there is exactly right. It could be as simple as uh, someone doing something by accident or on purpose. You have a lot of staff and employees who might click a link or start deleting files because they're being super helpful and they just want to help clean up to files and folders and they delete things. Or you might have staff who they know they're, they're leaving before you do and they don't want you to know what they've been up to that entire time. Or unfortunately, you have staff who might try to say a salesperson might try to take your whole sales funnel with them. You need to know that information. So how do you get that information back? when the systems tell you that you need to be using a backup. This is why you need to have SaaS protection. Both uh, Microsoft and Google actually state in their SLAs, so that fine print that we read through and say we click the terms and conditions, I'm sure everyone here watching has read all of the terms and conditions of everything that you ever clicked through. I guarantee I've not, and I will omit that straight up. But in those SLAs that we promise that we read the terms and conditions, it states that you must use a third party supplier to back up your information and they are not responsible for any data loss. So everything that we just talked about, all of those people, looking at statistics around it, 7% of data loss is caused by malicious deletions. So those employees who don't want you to know what you're doing, or as Delcy said, those rogue employees who really don't want you to know what they're doing and might be stealing actual information from you. You might have um, viruses and hackers, all those bad guys, and then, uh, then just the average end user deletions. But we also have to talk about Ransom Cloud. This is relatively new within the last few years. Just imagine if you click something on your computer and all your emails are gone. There's specific ransomware that's now targeting the systems that we have to use every single day, especially in this work from anywhere world, to interact together. With Ransom Cloud, you get, say it's Friday. 
Friday, 3 p.m., you are ready to head out. It was a great week. You want to head out to the mountains. You want to head out to wherever. And you are busy and there's a lot of things going on. And let's face it, we are your greatest risk because of all of those things. We get busy. We have things going on. You get an anti spam email, and even with your most training, Friday at 3 p.m., there's a good chance you're just going to want to get this done because you do not want to have to sit there on Monday and do it because you know what your Monday already looks like. So you click a button. And then next thing you know, you see the red screen of death. The red screen of death with a nice helpful help desk that'll tell you how to buy Bitcoin, ask you if you need any support. They're amazing. Their support systems are better than any support system that we have to use. Um, but all your files are locked unless you pay. That's why data SaaS protection is so important to talk about, because if you had this in place, you would easily be able to roll back to the previous version. It would be all fixed for you and you wouldn't have to worry at all. Data SAX protection, it's unlimited, uh, quick and a simple setup, even in the remote world can be set up from anywhere at any point in time. And it um, doesn't matter how big or small you are, whether you're a two person mom and dad pop shop all the way to enterprise, it will work with you. So I promise that we talk about RTO and RPO a little bit more. This conversation is so important because it's the difference of understanding and making an informed decision on what your actual bandwidth loss can be. How often RPO, recovery point objected, are you backing up your information? If you were a university professor and you're only backing up your information once a week, during grading season, that's a lot of information to lose. Or maybe you're uh, in the tax bracket and or doing taxes and you lose all that information for an entire tax season, that's incredibly detrimental. And I've talked to those business owners who actually have never had that thought process before. They don't back up that information. And if something was to happen, they would lose their entire information or their entire business. So, and... So if a disaster, and then going back to RTO, so your recovery time objective, when a disaster is to strike, how quickly will it get back up and running? And how much is that hourly downtime going to cost your business? This isn't just to think about ransomware. This goes back to the rate, knowing your hourly downtime, how much bandwidth do you have? Whether it be an internet outage, whether it be a fire or flood, whether it be um, just the random times your computers might crash. How many hours can your business afford that before it actually seriously affects? We have a, a questionnaire. We we'll work with you at any point in time. It is oh, 10 simple questions, six current data storage questions, four state of the business. And at the end of this, you can have that educated um, conversation with yourself and with your business, and with your coworkers, being like, okay, my business will have, um, will cost $24,000 in losses an hour, $5,000, $10,000, $20,000. And we have yearly on average 10 hours of out downage. If we got hit by a ransomware attack, it would take us two weeks to be back up and running. What does that actually look like? And then when I'm talking about a backup business continuity solution, is it worth the investment to not only protect my business like you would with insurance, but also help you sleep at night and make sure that if and when this happens, you don't actually ever have to even have the conversation if you should pay the bad guys. Because let's face it, you don't want to pay the bad guys. When you're paying the bad guys, you're finding the worst of the worst, the darkest of the darkest things that you don't even want to think about. You're giving those people money and we don't want to do that. So instead, having a situation in place that protects your business is incredibly important and really will just help you sleep better at night. So with that, I'm going to pass it right back to Delcy. Delcy, that was fun. Thank you very much, Desiree. That was very helpful. And in just a few minutes, we will open it up for questions for Desiree. If you guys want to learn more about the actual technology that powers the solutions that we were just talking about. But before we do that, I just want to kind of rein us back in a little bit and kind of ask the question of where do I go from here? I'm sure there's some people on this call who know that they need to address their backups. There might be other people on this call who don't know, who maybe they're not sure if their backups are adequate enough or not. And then there might be people on here who think they're in pretty good shape, but wouldn't mind just having a second opinion. In any of those cases, we're here to help. And to the point that Desiree made, there's great tools we can use to help you evaluate where are you at today? And oftentimes we do that using the types of questions that you saw in that questionnaire. We first wanna understand what is the impact of downtime and data loss to your business? 
From there, we can help you assess whether or not you have the right backups. Because there is no single one size fits all solution when it comes to DR. It truly does need to be customized to your business. You need to find a solution that makes sense for the size company you have, the data you have, where that data lives, how it's accessed, how confidential it is, whether there's compliance involved. There's so many factors that what's really important is that we go through that questionnaire to understand what makes sense, what do you need, and then do you have the solution today that aligns with those needs, or is there an opportunity to address through additional solutions or changes to your backup strategy to better align what you need with what you have. And it's very easy to get a quote. If we go through that questionnaire process and we identify that there is a gap, either you wanna be able to recover within six hours or three hours or six minutes and your current backup doesn't allow for that. Or you don't think you could stomach more than two hours of data loss, but your current backup doesn't account for that. It's very easy for our team to turn around and get you a quote for what a solution would look like using the advanced tools that data provides to do that. And data's got an entire suite of solutions. They also believe that it's not a one size fits all market. And so they have tools designed for businesses that operate exclusively in the cloud. They have tools designed for larger businesses, smaller businesses, and clients that have different needs and different requirements from a compliance standpoint. So no matter what it is that you're looking for, if there is a discrepancy between what you have and what you need, we can easily and quickly turn around a quote for you so that you can better understand what it would take to get to that level. And ultimately, our job is to be your Sherpa, to guide you every step of the way, to kind of see around the corner, to help you understand this. And that's one of the reasons why we put this webinar together today is we feel like there's a lot of organizations who need some help looking around this latest corner. They aren't aware that backup systems have changed dramatically and the types of backups needed have changed dramatically. And therefore we wanna be there to help educate you to that reality, but also be there to help you figure out how do you align your expectations and needs with the solutions and products that are out there. And so with that, I am going to turn it back over to Elle who's going to uh, take it from here. <laughs> thanks, Delcy, and thanks, Desiree. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, raise your hand. It looks like I already have one question here. Um, what happens if the hackers encrypt the backups as part of a ransomware attack? Yeah, so I can speak to that for a moment, and then Desiree, if you have anything to add, please do. Uh, this is something that happens a lot. I mentioned this a little bit in the presentation earlier. We have seen a number of events where we've been called in to do the remediation. And the first thing the hackers did was destroy the backups. Um, I'll give you one example without saying who the company was, but a local business in our community, the hackers got into the network about six months before they actually installed the ransomware. During those six months, they mapped out all of the data where the data lives, where it's backed up to, and figured out what data they identified to be the most valuable, the most helpful, the data that's accessed and used the most by the business. They then created a complex process where they mapped out each of the backups and over a long period of time found ways to gain access to those backup systems. In this case, it wasn't a data backup system and they were able to install something called a key logger on a machine that they knew was sometimes used to log into the backup solution. Eventually, somebody logged in, they got their credentials, and then they were able to use those to log into all the other backups. From there, they just started studying what the backup solution was. In this case, it was a NAS device, which is basically just a box full of hard drives plugged into the network, and the backups were being stored on that device. When it came to D-Day, when they finally executed the attack, the first thing they did at two o'clock in the morning on Friday night was go through each of those backup systems and run a command that is actually built into those backups to wipe and destroy all the data. And that command is there in case you're recycling your backup system and you wanna make sure that any data that was on there is erased and isn't stolen by hackers. The hackers use that same technology to destroy the client's backups in a way that was totally unrecoverable. It overrode the data so many times that there was no way to recover it, which is exactly what that command was intended to do. Once they were confident the backups were destroyed, they then ran the ransomware 
And they ran the ransomware in order of the data that was being impacted so that when the attack was detected and the servers were shut down, they guaranteed the most important data would be infected at that point in time. So that even if we responded quickly, they would still deliver the payload to the most important data. This is one of the most successful attacks we've ever witnessed. Uh, it was a very significant uh, attack, but these are the types of attacks that we're seeing. And that's why you're seeing the ransoms go up. You hear about ransoms now that are hundreds of thousands of dollars and even millions of dollars. The reason is because they spent a lot of time and money putting these attacks together. It used to be that they threw a really kind of cheap, simple attack. It was more of a volume game. They would try to hit as many businesses as possible, try to get $5,000 per company. And it was just a numbers thing. Now the approach is much more, they'll spend a lot more time and attention really going after business, but in return, they're going to ask for a lot more money to get that data back. And unfortunately, the other thing we're starting to see, and we have an upcoming webinar just on this topic, is how the insurance industry is also changing. And more and more, we're seeing insurance agencies not pay ransoms. They'll have specific ransomware in, um, riders in the contract that say they don't have to cover ransomware, or they'll have exemptions that say, if you weren't doing all of the right things, one of which is having the proper backup solutions in place, then they won't pay the ransom because they're getting sick of paying out multi-million dollar ransom cases on an $1,800 a month year policy. Desiree, anything you would add to that? Wow. How is that client, uh, that, that person? I feel so bad. That's a whole, uh, really sad story. It was fortunately or unfortunately, depending on how you look at it, their insurance company did not have a ransomware rider. This was still about a year ago before those were as common. The insurance company did pay out $1.5 million in ransom wow. and gave us the recovery key. But to your point earlier, even with the recovery key, even after paying out a million and a half, this ended up being a 700 person company with six different offices. It still took three weeks to get them fully operational because even once you have the key, you still have to remove the ransomware and decrypt all the data. And it's still an enormous amount of work to undo the damage. So a million and a half hours, a million and a half dollars and three weeks later, that business was back up and running, but with a lot of significant costs. That is absolutely crazy. And then another thing that I've been hearing recently is that a lot of the insurance providers are starting to look at it as acts of terrorism, depending on the companies and how it's hit, because there are countries like Russia is a great example that Russia has Russia, the Russian government has ruled the hackers. If you don't, if you don't attack us, you can attack whoever you want and we won't extradite you, we won't punish you, and we won't allow any of the other countries to try to, to, to punish you at all, but just don't attack us. And it's absolutely crazy because these bad guys run around and these, they, they blatantly let everyone know exactly who they are, exactly what they're doing, and they're making these huge paydays. Um, but yes, I do. To talk about Datto, um, uh, immutable cloud, mic drop, that should just be it. <laughs> no, because I probably should explain it a little bit more. All of that would have, what Delcy had just said, would have been stopped if you couldn't rewrite the backup, just flat out. And so that was one of our biggest things that we had to um, figure out and then learn how to develop and then build was the immutable cloud. And what that means is even the bad guys, when they get in and they to put in ransomware, if you can't rewrite the backup, if you can't do that at all, so you can't delete it, well, there's two different answers here. If you can't rewrite the backup, then you can't rewrite it so you can't add ransomware you can't delete it and then the other thing is is we actually have a, a secondary backup that is outside of only data employee or certain data employees can access but all of our backups are actually not deleted they're held for a certain amount of time in a certain place like even if the very worst mutable cloud backups can't be rewritten bad guys are smart. There's always something is able to be broken. If they really, really want to, they will. So we always need to have layers and layers and layers on security, especially in a company our size who, let's face it, bad guys could look at us as a victim. So on layers on layers, the backups, the bad guys can't even see, even if they were to get through the immutable cloud and get through all those steps, there's even if they were able to delete the backup, there's another backup that they can't see that's completely separate that you would just be able to roll back your managed service better. So you're protected on several different levels. Um, 
from the bad guys and needs more targeted attacks. That's great. Elle, any other questions for either myself or Desiree? Yep, it looks like we got a question in the chat. Um, is ransomware targeted at SMBs more or less frequently compared to other cyber attacks? Should SMBs approach their security strategy for attacks like ransomware differently than bigger organizations? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the attacks are often similar in the sense that I think, to Desiree's point earlier, when you look at these big attacks, um, the gas pipeline, with Target, Equifax, Sony, a lot of times it actually is the same point of entry. It's one of two things. Either it's an out-of-date technology, like an old computer or even a newer computer, but just isn't patched or updated properly, or it's a human being. It's a somebody who clicked a link, did something they weren't supposed to do, usually unintentionally without knowing it, um, that allowed the hack in. So the, the point of entries are similar. The, however, once the hacker is in the network, that can be very different. So the small and medium-sized businesses don't typically have nearly as much protection against things like ransomware. So they're going to be more commonly targeted for that type of an infection once the hackers gain access to the network. On an enterprise company, it's a little bit more common that they're going to try to steal the data like we saw in Equifax. So when you're going after a really small business, there's not as much data. It's not going to be as valuable. There's probably a higher return on investment to cause some sort of ransomware attack and extract money from the business owner themselves or their insurance provider. In a larger company, you might make more money selling off the data that you've stolen or causing some sort of damage to the business from that perspective. So the point of entries are similar, but the actual execution of the attack afterwards can be different. And therefore, I would say that small businesses, with the exception of a few notable ones that we've seen in the news, tend to be the more common targets for ransomware specifically. I just want to add one more thing to that. One thing, um, I loved how you talked about both of those points. And the only additional one, and I would say, is password management. Yeah. Um, your credentials are leaked constantly. If you are using the same password on anything, especially your social and your business accounts, if you're going to take away anything from this presentation, go change those right away. Use a password manager and change those passwords. There was a password leak um, in early June, the biggest password leak in history. There was enough passwords were leaked for every single person who uses the internet two or three times. Think about how many passwords that is. Now think about how many people, there's probably some here, are using more passwords, your passwords more than once. Facebook constantly has uh, password leaks. Most of these places constantly has credentials leaked. And so what will happen is a lot of these bad guys will just buy credential packages on the dark web. You get what one password's worth, say 50, 50 cents. They'll buy a hundred of them, 200, 300 packages, right? You buy more, you buy the better the price you get. And then you take those passwords, you throw them in a system and they just do credential stuffing. So they stuff those passwords everywhere, like every banking system, every account, every system they can possibly think about until things start opening up. The gas line attack, that was a password. That was someone using the same password across multiple things, and they got that password and stuffed their credentials and then were able to find access to an admin account, and that's where that whole thing started. One person, one password using on multiple devices. So using um, a password manager and understanding that your credentials, your information is valuable enough that if leaked, which chances are, especially if you're using your passwords across social accounts and real life accounts, that there's an opportunity there for the bad guys just to look at low hanging fruit. These are businesses. These are these not decent, the crappy people, but these are business people who just work in an office and they have on the day their list of emails that they're going to attack and that's what they do and they try to at the end of the day they have a sales target and they want to hit their sales target and if your business ends up being the lowest hanging fruit well you just help them hit their sales target so they're happy you're definitely not but that's what it is to them it's not a personal thing it's a transaction so whatever your business is to you if it's valuable i know i've said this a few times so i apologize but if your value if your business is valuable enough to you that you would pay someone to get your to keep your business up and running then they then you're there for that like you therefore are a good target for the bad guys yeah i agree completely al any final questions 
Um, yes. Do you offer any kind of assessment for cybersecurity? Yes, that's a great question. And it is often a good starting point. You know, we talked about the kind of questionnaire that we can use to assess your backups. But if you want to go a step further and actually do a broader cybersecurity assessment, talking about things like Desiree just mentioned with password management, we can look at how people are remotely connecting into your network. We can look at how physically secure your data and your equipment is within your premises, looking at whether you have the proper cloud backups. We do have different assessment packages and we'd be happy to talk to anybody about what those offerings are and help you identify which assessment package may be appropriate for your size business and for the information that you're trying to learn. Uh, so it's a great question and something we'd be happy to follow up with you about um, offline. Okay, and does anyone have any more questions? Um, it looks like we just got one. Uh, is Datto compliant with any compliance bodies such as NIST or HIPAA? Yeah, so Desiree, I don't know if you want to speak to that or if you'd like me to. Either, uh, my answer is going to be yes, and if you want to go into more detail. But I yeah, I think that's exactly right. And we've, we've got clients who are dealing with um, Department of Defense, who are dealing with HIPAA, who are dealing with Sarbanes-Oxley. And in every single scenario, Datto has presented us the appropriate documentation to share with the compliance body that documents how they are compliance with each of those governmental and private compliance organizations. So if you are mandated to comply with any of those different agencies or some other five letter acronym, uh, the chances are that Datto does, is compliant and can actually give you the documentation that you would need to share with your auditor. Any other um, questions, Al? Um, I don't see any. Um, I just want to give people another moment just in case we get one more. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. All right, well, thank you all for coming today and for tuning in to learn more about this. As we mentioned, if you want to talk more and have either an assessment done or go through that questionnaire that we talked about a couple of different times, please do not hesitate to reach out. This is such an important topic and it's much, much more enjoyable to have this conversation now than it is to have it after the fact when some amount of data has been lost. So please take a moment and make sure that you feel good about the backups you have. And if you have any hesitations or questions, reach out so we can talk more. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Thanks, Desiree. Thanks for being here. Thanks for joining, everyone.